Hare Krishna, my friends. Welcome to Bhaktiville's Friday night reading of the Nectar of Devotion. Last week we were reading about Krishna's cowherd friends and we'll continue with that topic tonight. We're on page 339 of the book and page 377 of the PDF. But first let me offer my obeisances. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamin Uti Namine. I offer my respectful obeisances unto His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is very dear to Lord Krishna, having taken shelter at His lotus feet. Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyashta Kripa Sindhu Pyevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha. I also offer my respectful obeisances unto the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord here and throughout the universe. They are just like desire trees and can fulfill the desires of everyone, and they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. All right, page 339 of the, PDF, of the book, or 377 of the PDF, and just a little um, recap because it, it jumps right into the Kaishori age of Krishna. This is a section about Krishna's cowherd boys, boyfriends, and uh, the relationships that he has with them. Um, there are well-wishers, friends. Uh, well-wishers are a little bit older. His friends are a little bit younger. His confidential friends are about his age, as are his intimate friends. And the ages that um, is, are being discussed from zero to five years old as the Kumara, the Kumaras um, age, and six to ten years old is the Poganda age, and eleven to fifteen is the Kaishora age, and then at age sixteen he goes to Mathura and leaves Vrindavan. So that's just a little a little recap of what we've been been reading <clears throat> over the past couple of weeks. This is a chapter on fraternal loving affairs. We'll start at the top of page 339. The symptoms of the Kaishora age are already described, and it is at this age that devotees generally most appreciate Krishna. Krishna with Radharani is worshipped as Kishora Kishori. Krishna does not increase his age beyond this form of Kaishora, and it is confirmed in the Brahma Samhita that although he is the oldest personality and has innumerable different forms, his original form is always youthful. In the pictures of Krishna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, we can see that he is youthful, although at that time he was old enough to have sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons. <clears throat> Excuse me. The cowherd boyfriends of Krishna once said, quote, my dear Krishna, you need not decorate your body with so many ornaments. Your transcendental features are themselves so beautiful that you do not require any ornamentation." End quote. So there's some notes here uh, in chat. Kandita says, eternal Kishore age. How wonderful. Yes. And Bhaktiminula says, for sure. Yes. All right. At this age, whenever Krishna begins to vibrate his flute early in the morning, all of his friends immediately get up from bed just to join him in going to the pasturing grounds. One of the friends once said, quote, My dear cowherd friends, the sound of Krishna's flute from above Govardhan Hill is telling us that we need not go to search him out on the bank of the Yamuna, end quote. Parvati, well, Greece has something in chat. He says, Krishna is not a Christmas tree. He doesn't need ornaments. That's funny. Um, okay, back to the text. Parvati, the wife of Lord Shiva, just told, uh, told her husband, quote, My dear Panchamukha, five-faced, just look at the Pandavas. After hearing the sound of Krishna's conch shell, known as Panchajanya, they have regained their strength and are just like lions." End quote. At this age, Krishna once dressed himself up exactly like Radharani. 
just to create fun among his friends. He put on golden earrings, and because he was blackish, he smeared the pulp of kunkum all over his body in order to become as fair as she, and that's she, capital S, Radharani. By seeing this dress, Krishna's friend Subal became very astonished. Krishna sometimes played with his intimate friends by engaging in fighting or wrestling with their arms, sometimes by playing ball, sometimes by playing chess, sometimes by carrying one another on the shoulders, and sometimes by exhibiting their expertness at whirling logs. And the cowherd friends used to please Krishna by sitting together with him on couches. It says coaches on coaches or on swings. Coaches. Anyway, by lying together on their beds, by joking together, and by swimming in the pool. All these activities are called Anubhava. Whenever all the friends would assemble in the company of Krishna, they would immediately engage in all these functions, especially in dancing together. Regarding their wrestling, one friend once asked Krishna, quote, My dear friend, O killer of the Aga demon, you are very proudly wandering among your friends, trying to exhibit your arms as very strong. Is it that you are envious of me? I know that you cannot defeat me in wrestling, and I also know that you were sitting idly for a long time because you were hopeless of defeating me. End of quote. All the friends were very daring and would risk any difficulty because they were confident that Krishna would help them to be victorious in all adventures. They used to sit together and advise one another what to do, sometimes inducing one another to be engaged in welfare work. Sometimes they would offer betel nuts to one another, decorate one another's faces with tilak or smear pulp of chandan on one another's bodies. Sometimes, for the sake of, of amusement, they used to decorate their faces in strange ways. Another business of the friends was that each of them wanted to defeat Krishna. Sometimes they used to snatch his clothing or snatch away the flowers from his hands. Sometimes one would try to induce another to decorate his body for him, and failing this, they were always ready to fight challenging one another to combat in wrestling. These were some of the general activities of Krishna and his friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. Greece uh, says something in chat. I shall draw a tiger's face on Kandita with Tilak to make her more brave. There you go. All right. Another important pastime of the friends of Krishna was that they served as messengers to and from the gopis. They introduced the gopis to Krishna and canvassed for Krishna. When the gopis were in disagreement with Krishna, these friends would support Krishna's side in his presence. But when Krishna was not present, they would support the side of the gopis. In this way, sometimes supporting one side, sometimes the other, they would talk very privately with much whispering in the ears, although none of the business was very serious. Um, over in chat, Kandita is laughing at Greece's comment. And she's now she's roaring. <laughs> okay, back to the text. The servants of Krishna were sometimes engaged in collecting flowers, decorating his body with valuable ornaments and trinkets, dancing before him, singing, helping him herd the cows, massaging his body, preparing flower garlands, and sometimes fanning his body. These were some of the primary duties of the servants of Krishna. The friends and servants of Krishna were combined together in serving him, and all of their activities are known as Anubhava. When Krishna came out from the Yamuna, after chastising the Kaliya Naga, Sridham wanted to embrace him first, but he could not raise his arms because of his great feeling of respect. When Krishna used to play on his flute, it appeared just like the roaring of clouds in the sky during the constellation of Svati. 
According to Vedic astronomical calculation, if there is rain during the constellation of the Svati star, any rain falling on the sea will produce pearls, and rain falling on a serpent will produce jewels. Similarly, when Krishna's flute roared like a thundercloud under the Svati constellation, the resulting perspiration on Sridham's body appeared to be just like pearls. When Krishna and Subal were embracing one another, Srimati Radharani became a little envious, and hiding her hot temperament, she said, quote, My dear Subal, you are very fortunate, because even in the presence of superiors, you and Krishna have no hesitation in putting your arms on each other's shoulders. I think it must be admitted that in your previous lives, you have succeeded in many kinds of austerities, end quote. The idea is that although Radharani was accustomed to put her arms on Krishna's shoulders, it was not possible for her to do such a thing in the presence of her superiors, whereas Subal could do so freely. Radharani therefore praised his good fortune. When Krishna entered the lake of Kaliya, his intimate friends became so perturbed that their bodily colors faded and they all produced horrible gurgling sounds. At that time, all of them fell down on the ground as if they were unconscious. Similarly, when there was a forest fire, all of Krishna's friends neglected their own protection and surrounded Krishna on all sides to protect him from the flames. This behavior of the friends toward Krishna is described by thoughtful poets as Vyavichari. In Vyavichari, ecstatic love for Krishna, there is sometimes madness, dexterity, fear, laziness, jubilation, pride, dizziness, meditation, disease, forgetfulness, and humbleness. These are some of the common symptoms in the stage of Vyavichari, ecstatic love for Krishna. When there are dealings between Krishna and his friends, which are completely devoid of any feelings of respect, and they all treat one another on an equal level, such ecstatic love in friendship is called stai. When one is situated in this confidential, friendly relationship with Krishna, one shows symptoms of love, such as attraction, affection, affinity, and attachment. An example of stai was exhibited when Arjuna, and this is, there's a footnote here, this is a different Arjuna, uh, living in Vrindavan is different from the friend of the same name to whom Bhagavad Gita was spoken. So, uh, this is, ex stai is exhibited when Arjuna told Akura, quote, my dear son of Gandini, please ask Krishna, when I shall be able to embrace him in my arms." End quote. When there is full knowledge of Krishna's superiority, and yet in dealings with him on friendly terms, respectfulness is completely absent. That stage is called affection. There is one brilliant example of this affection. When the demigods, headed by Lord Shiva, were offering respectful prayers to Krishna, Describing the glorious opulences of the Lord, Arjuna, the same one who lives in Vrindavan, stood before him with his hand on his shoulders and brushed the dust from his peacock feather, Krishna's peacock feather. Very sweet. When the Pandavas were banished by Duryodhana and forced to live incognito in the forest, no one could trace out where they were staying. At that time, the great sage Narada met Lord Krishna and said, quote, My dear Mukunda, although you are the supreme personality of Godhead, the all-powerful person, by making friendship with you, the Pandavas have become bereft of their legitimate right to the kingdom of the world, and moreover, they are now living in the forest incognito. Sometimes they must work as ordinary laborers in someone's house. These symptoms appear to be very inauspicious materially, but the beauty is 
that the Pandavas have not lost their faith and love for you in spite of all these tribulations. In fact, they are always thinking of you and chanting your name in ecstatic friendship." End quote. Another example of acute affection for Krishna is given in the 10th canto, 15th chapter, 15th verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. In the pasturing ground, Krishna felt a little tired and wanted to take rest, so he laid down on the ground. At that time, many cowherd boys assembled there and with great affection began to sing suitable songs so that Krishna would rest nicely. There is a nice example of the friendship between Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. When the fighting was going on, Ashvatama, the son of Dr Dronacharya, unceremoniously attacked Krishna. Although according to the prevailing rules of chivalry, one's chariot driver should never be attacked by the enemy. But Ashvatama behaved heinous, heinously in so many ways that he did not hesitate to attack Krishna's body, although Krishna was acting only as charioteer for Arjuna. When Arjuna saw that Ashvatama was releasing various kinds of arrows to hurt Krishna, he immediately stood in front of Krishna to intercept all of them. At that time, although Arjuna was being harmed by those arrows, he felt an ecstatic love for Krishna, and the arrows appeared to him like showers of flowers. There is another instance of ecstatic love for Krishna in friendship. Once, when a cowherd boy named Rishab was collecting flowers from the forest to prepare a garland to be offered to Krishna, the sun had reached its zenith, and although the sunshine was scorching hot, Rishabha felt it as the moonshine. That is the way of rendering transcendental loving service to the Lord. When devotees are put into great difficulties, even like the Pandavas, as described above, they feel all their miserable conditions as great facilities for serving the Lord. Another instance of Arjuna's friendship with Krishna is described by Narada, who reminded Krishna, quote, when Arjuna was learning the art of shooting arrows, he could not see you for so many days. But when you arrived there, he stopped all his activities and immediately embraced you. End quote. This means that even though Arjuna was engaged in learning about the military art, he had not forgotten Krishna for a moment. And as soon as there was an opportunity to see Krishna, he immediately embraced him. One servant of Krishna named Putri once addressed him like this, quote, My dear Lord, you protected the cowherd boys from the hunger of the Agasura demon, and you protected them from the poisonous effects of the Kaliya snake, and you also saved them from the fierce forest fire. But I am suffering from your separation, which is more severe than the hunger of Agasura, the poison of Lake Kaliya, and the burning of the forest fire. So why should you not protect me from the pangs of separation?" End quote. Another friend once told Krishna, quote, My dear enemy of Kamsa, since you have left us, the heat of separation has become extraordinary. And this heat is felt more severely when we understand that in Bandiravan, you are being refreshed by the waves of the cooling river known as Banutanaya Banu, Banu Radharani. End quote. The purport is that when Krishna was engaged with Radharani, the cowherd boys, headed by Subal, were feeling great separation, and that was unbearable for them. Another friend addressed Krishna thus, quote, My dear Krishna, O killer of Agasura, when you left Vrindavan to kill, Kimsa, kill King Kamsa in Matra, all the cowherd boys became bereft of their four putas, the elements of earth, water, fire, and space or ether. And the fifth puta, the air, was flowing very rapidly within their nostrils. End quote. 
When Krishna went to Mathura to kill King Kansa, all the cowherd boys became so afflicted by the separation that they almost died. When a person is dead, it is said that he has given up the five elements known as bhutas, as the body again mixes with the five elements from which it was prepared. In this case, although the four elements of the of earth, water, fire, and ether were already gone, the remaining element, air, was still very prominent and was blowing through their nostrils furiously. In other words, after Krishna left Vrindavan, they were always anxious about what would happen in his fight with King Kamsa. Another friend once informed Krishna, quote, when one of your friends was feeling much separation from you, there were tears covering his lotus eyes, so the black drones of sleep became discouraged from entering his eyes and left that place, end quote. When there is a lotus flower, the black drones fly into it to collect honey. The bees or the eyes of Krishna's friend are compared to the lotus flower. And because they were full of tears, the black drones of sleep could not collect honey from his lotus eyes and therefore left the place. In other words, because he was too much afflicted, his eyes were full of tears and he could not sleep. This is an example of staying up at night because of separation from Krishna. I found these, I just want to say something. I found these two paragraphs really um, revealing. I never really thought about the cowherd boys and their feelings of separation. We always read all the stories about the gopis and their separation from Krishna. And I just never really thought about the cowherd boys. And here they are feeling similar symptoms of separation from Krishna after he leaves Vrindavan. All right, let me keep going here. An example of helplessness is described in the following statement, quote, due to Krishna's departure from Vrindavan to Mathura, Krishna's dearest cowherd boys felt a mental, mentally light as possible. They were like fragments of cotton, lighter than the air, and were all floating in the air without any shelter. End quote. In other words, the minds of the cowherd boys became almost vacant on account of Krishna's separation, and they are compared with fragments of cotton floating in the air without any shelter. An example of impatience was also shown by the cowherd boys when Krishna went to Mathura. Out of the sorrow, sorrow of separation, all these boys forgot to take care of their cow herding and tried to forget all the melodious songs they used to sing in the pasturing ground. At last, they had no desire to live anymore, being separated from Krishna. An example of stillness was described by a friend of Krishna who informed him in Mathura that all the cowherd boys had become just like leafless trees on the tops of hills. They appeared almost naked, skinny, and frail, and did not carry any fruits or flowers. He informed Krishna that all the cowherd boys residing in Vrindavan were as still as the trees at the tops of hills. Sometimes they felt diseased from their separation from Krishna, and being so greatly disappointed, they were aimlessly wandering on the banks of the Yamuna. There is also an example of madness caused by separation from Krishna. When Krishna was absent from Vrindavan, all the cowherd boys became bewildered, and having given up all kinds of activities, they appeared to be mad and forgot all their regular business. They were sometimes lying down on the ground, sometimes rolling in the dust, sometimes laughing, and sometimes running away very swiftly. All of these symptoms gave them the appearance of madmen. One friend of Krishna's criticized him by saying, quote, My dear Lord, you have become the king of Mathura after killing Kamsa, and that is very good news for us. But at Vrindavan, all the residents have become blind from their continuous crying over your absence. They are full only of anxieties and are not cheered at all by your becoming the king of Mathura. 
Sometimes there were also signs of death caused by separation from Krishna. Once Krishna was told, quote, My dear enemy of Kamsa, because of their separation from you, the cowherd boys are suffer suffering too much, and they are now lying down in the valleys, breathing only slightly. In order to sympathize with the boys' regrettable condition, even the forest friends, the deer, are shedding tears. End quote. In the Mathura Kanda chapter of the Skanda Purana, there is a description of Krishna and Balaram, surrounded by all the cowherd boys, always engaged in taking care of the cows and calves. When Krishna was met by Arjuna at a potter's shop in the city of Drupada Nagara, because of the similarity of their bodily features, they became intimate friend there. They made intimate friendships. This is an instance of friendship caused by the attraction of sim similar bodies. In the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 71st chapter, and that should be the 27th verse, it is stated that when Krishna arrived in the city of Indraprastha, Bhima was so overwhelmed with joy that with tears in his eyes and a smiling face, he immediately embraced his maternal cousin. Following him were his younger brothers, Nakula and Sahadev, along with Arjuna, and they all became so overwhelmed at seeing Krishna that with full satisfaction they embraced the Lord, who is known as Achuta, the infallible. There's a similar statement about the cowherd boys of Vrindavan. When Krishna was on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, all the cowherd boys came to see him, wearing jeweled earrings in their ears. Becoming so greatly overjoyed, they extended their arms and embraced Krishna as their old friend. These are instances of full satisfaction in friendship with Krishna. In the 10th canto, 12th chapter, and that should be the 12th verse of Srimad Bhavatam, it is stated that even after undergoing severe penances and austerities and performing the yogic principles, the great mystic yogis, can hardly become eligible to achieve the dust of the lotus feet of Krishna. But the same personality of Godhead Krishna is easily available to the vision of the residents of Vrindavan. This means there is no comparison to these devotees' great fortune. The friendly relationship of the cowherd boys with Krishna is a particular type of spiritual ecstasy, almost similar to the ecstasy of conjugal love. It is very difficult to explain this ecstasy of loving affairs between the cowherd boys and Krishna. Great expert devotees like Rupa Goswami and others express their astonishment at the inconceivable feelings which are in Krishna and his cowherd boyfriends. This particular type of ecstatic love shared between Krishna and his confidential friends further develops into parental love. And on from there, it may develop into conjugal love, like the most exalted humor or mellow of ecstatic love between Lord Krishna and his devotees. And right on time, that's the end of that chapter. The next chapter is on parenthood. Bhakti Mimulas says, lovely. Kandita says, wow, that was amazing. Bhakti Mimulas in chat says, thank you. You're very welcome. Greece is well read. Thank you, Dasi. You're very welcome. It was really an amazing reading, wasn't it? I just, I had so much fun reading this tonight here and before class. So I always read it two or three times before I read it. So friendship can turn into conjugal love. I think he's talking about the progression of the rasas. That it goes from this fraternal love to the gopis love but i'll confirm that there's i i am still reading these the two versions um simultaneously so there's a whole big section i wasn't able to to read tonight uh you're asking not the same person i'm not sure what you're asking 
A person can move from a person can move from one rasa to the other. Yes. In fact, sometimes they can uh, have a second uh, body, a second incarnation, where they have both going on simultaneously. So, but I I will continue to read um, this uh, translation by Banu Swami uh, is really quite wonderful. And in the translation, there's commentary by uh, Rupa Goswami and also Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. So it's quite wonderful. Reese in chat says, I think it will please Krishna by pleasing others and making people happy. I'm one of the DJs for SL 20, 20B. Short for Second Life's 20th birthday. Oh, that's what it is. Oh, that's great. Well, throw in some Hare Krishna there. And Bhakta Mimula says, I can see why they call this the nectar of devotion. Absolutely. I don't think they'd like me very much if I played Hare Krishna music. But if well, I play least... with Krishna in mind, I think he would be happy. Oh, but there's some, some far out Hare Krishna stuff that's like hard metal. I mean, there's some really far out straight edge music out there. Hare Krishna stuff. Cool. I'll look. I'll look for. It. I'll look for it, and I'll. I'll text. I'll message you. Okay, because I usually play like trance and like video game music, like OC remixes. I don't think there's going to be a lot of room for Krishna, but if I keep Krishna in my heart, is the important part. Yes. All right. Thank you. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hi. All glories to Prabhupada. Hare okay. Krishna.